So good afternoon, everyone. It's a real treat to introduce you to, to Chris Fabricant, who's coming to us from the Innocence Project at Cardozo Law School. And uh, uh, some of you may be in our Duke Law Innocence Project, or uh, some of you may have come across the book or, or Chris's work, or for many of you, this may be your first introduction. I know a number of you are in my evidence class, and we haven't talked about expert evidence or forensic expert evidence. And so I, I told Chris that if he talks about things like Daubert or Rule 702, he can pause to explain a little bit. Uh, but um, it's a real treat to welcome Chris to Duke Law School. Chris is the Director of Special Litigation at the Innocence Project. And a big part of what they are doing and what Chris is doing is litigating issues of forensic evidence all around the country, uh, whether it is the use of cadaver dogs or bite mark evidence or firearms evidence, tool, tool mark evidence. Uh, you'll hear about lots of types of forensic evidence that, that you never knew were a thing before. Uh, and uh, what I asked Chris to do is to have this be a little bit informal. We'd love for you to ask questions and just kind of raise your hand if you have one. I'll start by asking a couple of questions. And first, I was hoping, because it's, it's always really a treat, hopefully, for you all to hear how someone became the lawyer that they are. I was hoping you could talk about some of your early work out of law school, some of your work in the Bronx uh, before you came to the Innocence Project, and then we could turn to your, your forensics-related litigation around the country in your book. But I'd, I'd love for you to first just tell us a little bit about, about yourself and some of the, especially some of the work that you're doing, which was not innocence work and how you got into clinical teaching and, and other types of client-centered litigation. Um, and then we can transition to your forensic science work. Does that great. sound good? That sounds great. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate everybody showing up. The, um, I'm sorry I didn't get any Doritos. The uh, um, <laughs> excellent Cheetos are good. Um, so yeah, I started, you know, one of the really interesting um, clerkships that are available that not a lot of people realize um, are pro se law clerks. And I'm not sure if they're around the country, but in the Southern District of New York, in the Eastern District, there are um, pro se um, clerkships that you can do for a couple of years. And that was really my first introduction to prisoner rights work because so much of that is around Section 1983 suits. And if you're not familiar with what Section 1983 is, this is the statute that allows private citizens to sue the government for violations of their constitutional rights. So you get a lot of very interesting work. And, and the pro se shop in, in the Southern District was very kind of friendly toward litigants in that we would often be drafting orders from judges to have uh, litigants replead their cases so they could make um, valid constitutional claims and that kind of thing. So it was really that was my first um, work and real exposure into prison conditions. And you would get a lot of misfiled and a lot of, 20, uh, a lot of habeas corpus type litigation. So habeas corpus litigation is often brought pro se. And, um, and I was there during the passage of the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act in 1997 that was just being implemented. This is probably another thing that you're not that familiar with, but this is really sawing off all of the avenues for post-conviction evaluation in federal courts of state court um, convictions. Overwhelmingly, wrongful convictions happen in state court. And they often aren't very fairly reviewed in state co appellate courts. And so this became like, you know, my real introduction into post-conviction litigation as well and really how unfair so much of it was. And that was in, it was much more fair than it is today. So I, I moved on after the clerkship and I did, uh, I was an appellate defender for uh, around five years. And so appellate work as a public defender is really, really challenging um, in that um, you don't have as much client contact. It's all very cerebral and can be kind of soul destroying because you read, you know, you're, you're confined to the record. You can't go outside of the record on a direct appeal. So whatever happened in court is really what happened. And, you know, and you think, you know, those of you who take trial advocacy and you learn about how to do an objection. And when you're doing appeals, you really realize how important those objections are. Because if you can just say objection, that's not going to be enough. You have to be very specific as to what you're objecting to. Otherwise, it's not preserved. And so a lot of um, I would learn about, you know, kind of these mistakes that trial attorneys were making. And these are New York City lawyers, some of them like fairly sophisticated, that were not very good trial lawyers. You know, you would watch and I would read 
cross-examinations that were just regurgitating exactly what the prosecution had elicited from this witness for the first time, but, you know, with sarcasm this time. It's like, oh, so you say you arrived at 9, right? And it was like, yes, I arrived at 9, right? So you would watch a lot of misconduct by police, obvious lies that weren't being challenged in court and that kind of thing, and then we would lose appeals all the time that we should win, you know what I mean? And you would go and you'd get beat up by an appellate court that had no interest in vindicating rights if your client appeared to have been guilty. And, um, but I will say, for those of you who are considering that type of work, that I became a very, very good writer and a very good researcher, and I was very, very productive. And those types of, you know, kind of core legal skills, you know, I've taken with me for the rest of my career. And, um, there's no better place to learn how to become, you know, a good persuasive writer. And, you know, and I see a lot of really brilliant young lawyers, grads from your schools, in other words, that are terrible writers or that they're not persuasive. They can lay out what the law is and they can write maybe a decent memo, but they don't really know how to write persuasively and how to use their best facts and how to really kind of disaggregate the law in a way that's going to help advance your cause. In appellate work, you know, I mean, particularly as a defense attorney, you are really forced to use all of the tools in the toolbox as far as, you know, advancing legal arguments and sometimes very, very tough cases. So I found that training invaluable. And as a result of that, also I learned the law. And I learned the law in New York. So I left a place called Appellate Advocates and I went to the Bronx Defenders to do trial work. And as brilliant as all the lawyers are that are typically hired at the Bronx Defenders, which is a, a very um, a great public defender shop in the South Bronx, is that um, so many of them don't know the law. Is that you don't know all the hearings that are available, you don't know all the appellate rules, you don't really understand preservation in the right way because you weren't taught that. You know, I mean, you go to your first arraignment shifts. And that's when you start learning how to do, you know, trial work. You know, I mean, you learn how to do a good cross-examination. You learn how to do investigations. But you learn how to become a client-centered lawyer. You learn how to do a good arraignment. You learn how things roll in the South Bronx. But you don't become a very good writer because you don't have time to write when you're doing, like, volume. You know, at any given time, and I write about this in my book a little, is that any given moment when I was at the Bronx Defenders, I had at least 100 clients. And at the time that I left... And, and to be clear, and I also say this in the book, is that my caseload was the envy of caseloads around the country of like your average public defender at the trial level. So you're not going to be doing great writing under those circumstances. You're not going to be able to file many robust motions. And I try to remember that when you and I are complaining about like the lack of Fry and Daubert litigation and like kind of effective challenges of junk science. But at the same time, you really learn everything about what you really need to know about the social justice issues and the human rights crisis in our American criminal legal system by doing trial level work and by going and standing by a client every day and watching how a racist, biased system plays out in court and how it affects, you know, everybody that it touches and that's entire communities. So when you're doing trial level work, and you have an understanding that your client is part of a community, that it has family, and has a mother that cares about him or her, and there are other people that are affected by this case. And then you kind of get an understanding of not just about the legal issues and about trial work, but you also get an understanding of what community policing means and what programs like CompStat are doing and programs like, you know, what parole really looks like and what parole monitoring looks like and what a drug treatment court is actually like and what it's good at and what it isn't good at. And, you know, and, and the best people that I've ever met have been in the Bronx and my colleagues from being a public defender, you know, so it's the best job you can possibly have. I encourage you all to do, if you have any interest in this, is like go try cases and that you'll meet really incredible people and you'll have incredible experiences, but it's very, very tough and it'll be a radicalizing experience. And that you'll, I think, it's fair to say, if you've got your eyes open, is that you'll understand it to be the human rights crisis that it is. And, you know, as a result, what you also come to understand from that type of work is that it's really hard to make change one client at a time. And, to, and when you're in representing individuals and you're interested in systemic change, it's hard to do right, is that you may make a difference on your individual clients, but are you really going to be able to shrink the, the size of the criminal justice system in this particular area? Are you going to be able to 
really create change. And I think most of us went to law school with the idea of helping people or creating change or maybe to make money. But the, uh, I, um, but if, if that wasn't your goal, then this is a, a good secondary option. And I became very interested in um, the policing strategies that were being used to arrest so many of my clients. So when I was doing appellate work, I think it's fair to say that virtually all my clients were factually guilty of at least some of the crimes that they had been charged with. Often they were overcharged. Often they got sentenced to much too much time. But I wasn't really that concerned about, like, oh, I have an innocent client on my hands. Once or twice there were a couple of cases. And then when I got to trial level work, I remember I was walking into my first arraignment shift. And this is also an experience that I write about because I was so stunned by it, was that my supervisor, my first supervisor, and I, I made some joke about people being guilty. I don't remember what it was. I was making it clear that that wasn't going to be an issue for me, but that it was something that I anticipated that my clients would be guilty. You know what I mean? And, that, um, and she said to me, it's like, you're going to be surprised. And I must have had in one night, you know, one is I represented at least 25 people, my first arraignment shift, and at least five or six of them had been totally innocent, had done nothing wrong, had, except for maybe piss off a police officer or being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And many of them had to plead guilty to crimes they hadn't committed because they couldn't make bail. Many of them had been in jail for a day or two and didn't know where their children were, didn't know how the, you know, I mean, somebody that was in a home daycare situation and got arrested for a turnstile jumping, I'll never forget it, my first night. She'd been in jail for uh, 18, 20 hours, you know I mean? I had no idea if, like, this home-based daycare was going to hold on to her child. So, you know, imagine this, you know, and she jumped the turnstile. Right. The, um, and so when you see those like, kind of stories and you see them routinely, you got to start thinking at a, at a more of a systemic level. And you realize that the strategies related to policing in places like New York City and other big cities around the country are really geographic based. And that they're using programs like ShotSpotter and, and CompStat and kind of basic stats to flood police resources to particular areas. And at that time, and again today, broken windows policing or zero tolerance type policing, where this theory is that if you tolerate low level crimes, then it fosters, you know, more violent crimes. There's no empirical evidence that's true. In fact, the opposite has been shown to be true that this type of policing is criminogenic. Nonetheless, this is a strategy that's currently being also by Mayor Adams, again, in New York. And so what I became interested in doing is doing geographic-based defense work in real community lawyering. And so I, got in, I left the Bronx Defenders and I started clinical teaching. I ran the criminal defense clinic at Pace Law School. And, and the clinic was also run in the, in the South Bronx. And what we did is adopted a block, a city block, and took all of my clinic took all the cases from that city block, and we did a participatory action research um, project in there to measure the policing costs of not just of uh, the dollars and cents on on um, how much it would cost to police this one city block, but also on the collateral consequences to the residents. Right, how many days of work and school missed for having to go to court, fines, fees, collateral consequences like that. And then our individual clients became plaintiffs for class action litigation, and we were one of the three stop and frisk cases against the NYPD. So I felt like you know our students were really learning how to like, litigate, and they tried misdemeanor cases, and then also kind of think about the work on a bigger, larger level, what more they could do with it. And so I was doing that kind of strategic litigation through um, clinical law program, and you know, one of the requirements for when they were going to start the strategic litigation department in the Innocence Project was to have successfully designed and executed a law reform program within the legal system. So it made me um, eligible or qualified for the role. I wasn't an expert in scientific evidence. I, um, I'm an English lit major, you know what I mean? So I think that what it shows is that you all can be experts in this if you've gotten this far. Um, Have you had cases before that involve DNA or fingerprints or firearms or? Yeah, you know, and I'm humiliated by the way I, I treated those cases now in retrospect. You know, I, like I, um, 2012 is when I started at the Innocence Project. There's maybe, and this is like another thing that, you know, is a, a major moment in my career, and so it was also a pivotal point in the book, is that the FBI had just uh, come to the Innocence Project, 
and had admitted after using microscopic hair comparison evidence for a century, right? And then really in the post-World War II era had, you know, professionalized it and made it sound sciencey. And had admitted for the first time after, and there already had been 70 known wrongful convictions by the time this day happened, but they came to the Instance Project, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and admitted out loud that we'd been wrong that we had been exaggerating the probative value of a so-called match for decades, and that we need your help to do an audit of thousands of cases uh, where our agents had testified falsely. And here we are 10 years later, and we're still reviewing those cases. And you know, one of the worst of those um, that really flowed from that audit was a case in North Carolina, Tim Bridges, you know what I mean, who was um, Convicted almost entirely on bite or on hair comparison evidence. So yeah, so all that like kind of led. So it was like, okay, now we're going to do strategic litigation around forensic sciences. You know, I mean, and eyewitness identification and course of interrogation stuff. So the these are the leading contributing factors to wrongful conviction, and that's what my department at the Innocence Project does is litigation around those factors. So let's focus on the forensic science yeah, piece yeah. of it today because yeah. because that's the focus of of junk science. And you should all read the junk science book. This is this is the book that you should read about forensic science. And I say this even as even as someone who has written a book about forensic science, you should read this book. Uh, and uh, um, and it tells some of the stories that he'll tell you today. But I don't know how, if you want to pick one of the early cases. If you want to talk about Keith Howard's case, since he lives just down the road from us. Uh, if you'd like to talk about the ongoing work in general involving. Bite mark evidence. Sure. Um, we could talk about all those things. We could talk about all those things. The, um, well, Keith Harward and I and you and, and Peter Neufeld gave a talk here um, not too long ago. That's the story that I opened the book with. I think it's, it's interesting to think about why bite marks, you know what I mean, to, to start there, is that, you know, <clears throat> Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld, the co-founders of the Instance Project, um, in 2012, when we started, we're still, you know, the, the driving force around our agenda and our litigation agenda. And so they both had a lot of thoughts about what kind of forensics we should be focusing on and why. And after a long debate, um, mostly between Barry and Peter, to be clear, and me listening, as uh, it was decided that we were going to look at bite marks and that this was the junkiest of the techniques that is still admissible in all 50 states and had led to, we weren't sure how many, but it seemed like a fair number of wrongful convictions. I mean, we knew about the DNA um, exonerations because we keep track of those, but there was some evidence that there had been a lot of others. And so we decided that we we're going to try to eliminate the use of bite mark evidence in the United States, which is a tall uh, task for, you know, one and then ultimately two lawyers to do, but we had all the facts. We had the National Academy of Sciences report on bite marks. We had all the wrongful convictions. All the research that had been generated had tended to discredit the technique. And so we set out to eliminate this field and to look for every bite mark conviction that we could find in the country. We took them pre-trial, we took them post-conviction, we took them on direct appeal, we looked at posthumous cases to see how many of these miscarriages of justice that we were going to be able to find because we could, you know, this, there's no stronger proof of concept as to, uh, you know, discrediting a forensic technique than an exoneration, you know, somebody that was convicted almost exclusively on this technique. And so, you know, I opened the book with the story of, you know, we went out and started looking for these cases, and then Eric Pilch, my old paralegal, who's um, now he's an associate at Cravath, but he was a paralegal at that time, and um, was just, would do all kinds of different research looking for these cases, and then just read Keith Harward's appellate opinion. And this is an appellate opinion that was affirming his guilt right, of um, this crime that happened in the early 1980s in Newport News, Virginia. In 1982, there was a young couple that was asleep in their bedroom in a two-story house. They had three children that were sleeping down the hall. Somebody broke in in the middle of the night, around 2 in the morning, and 
Teresa Perone, the surviving victim, opened her eyes in the middle of the night, and there was a sailor standing over her bed and beat her husband to death with a crowbar while she was still in bed, then pulled her out of bed and sexually assaulted her for the next three hours. She never got a very good look at the perpetrator. He put a diaper over her head for much of the assault, and then the lights were out when he took her downstairs. The only thing that was um, after he escaped or fled after the assault is that she gave a description of a sailor that was about five foot ten, that was about um, 150, 160 pounds, that he wore a, or that he was clean shaven, and that he had bitten her repeatedly on the thighs, and that was only evidence that they had. There was no eyewitness. There was no other forensic evidence. Um, there was no particular motive to speak of, and. Um, obviously a horrific crime. The children had slept through the entire thing. And what had happened right around this time is they had had the first um, bite mark cases had just come online because Ted Bundy, um, and I devote a chapter to Ted Bundy in my book, it was the first nationally televised trial in our country's history. And the case, and if you read the book, you'll be as, maybe as surprised as I was to learn that the case really rose and fell on bite mark evidence. They had almost nothing else on Ted Bundy, which is very surprising. The one ID that they had had was a hypnotized witness had, under hypnosis, had identified an employee of the sorority where the murders had taken place. And it was only after Bundy's arrest that she was shown his photograph, and so it's a single photo show up, as, uh, as Adele would tell you, there's like very bad eyewitness identification evidence, and they had bite marks. And the case had rose and fell on bite marks, as I said, and Lowell Levine, one of the experts in Keith Harward's trial, became an international celebrity as a result of it, and all of them went on to become rich and famous forensic junk scientists. And so Keith Harward, um, a few years later, there following what they believed to be their only lead, which was the bite mark evidence and this vague description. So they had the USS Carl Vinson is dry dot in Newport News, Virginia at the time. So the description that she provided roughly matched 3,000 people. And so what they did is the largest dental dragnet, I'm certain, in history, and they went and examined the teeth of all 3,000 people who um, matched the general description to see whether or not they could find a match for the bite mark. Keith Harward was examined during this twice and excluded as a potential biter, right? I mean, which is, that opinion is no more valid than inclusion, but he was, just as a point of fact, excluded. So fast forward, and we were talking about this today, about this, this time from incident to arrest, how this is maybe a, another indicator of a wrongful conviction, because months go by, and the Newport police are getting pressure from U.S. senators, Senator Alphonse D'Amato from New York amongst uh, one other senator, I think the, the one from Virginia, had um, written to the Navy and to the, the public, or to the police department, putting pressure on them to make an arrest. So Keith Harward gets into a drunken fight with his girlfriend. The girlfriend hits him with a frying pan. He bites her on the shoulder. Now we have a sailor who roughly matches the description, and he's a biter. They take him to, uh, he gets arrested, and they take the victim, Teresa Perone, to his arraignment, right, where is the most suggestive circumstance you could possibly make an identification in is he's under arrest for a domestic violence assault, and he's in handcuffs, and he's a known biter, and he's a sailor. And they ask Teresa Perone, is that the guy? You know, I mean, she's sitting in the gallery, and she won't ID him. The clients who, you know, not, you know, 99% of their, you know, crime victims would have made that identification. And so it should have been uh, a really clear indication that it was not him. And they ignored the fact that Keith Harward wore a mustache, which many of these wrongful convictions will tell you is one of the most um, diagnostic of reliability is, or unreliability is if you miss something like that, like a face tattoo or something. So they didn't have that. They had already had this exclusion from the bite marks, but they felt like they had the right guy. And so you get this with subjective techniques like bite mark evidence, and, and all forensics have some subjectivity, some much more than others. So the influence of ir irrelevant case facts that lead to biased decision making, so cognitive bias will play a role in, um, and we can talk about why that is in a minute maybe, is that they knew all these facts about the case, 
and Lowell Levine knew this in particular, and so he matches the bite marks to Keith Harward to exclusion of everybody else on the planet. He gets uh, uh, like an apprentice type, makes the same decision, and then they go back to the original people that had excluded him and like, are you sure about this? Because we have this superstar forensic dentist who says that this is, my oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, the, so they change their minds. And they can't even find a defense expert that was willing to disagree with this superstar from the Ted Bundy trial. And Keith Harward gets convicted, sentenced to life in prison. He actually gets convicted twice, but that's a different story, but on the same evidence. And spends the next 34 years in prison until my paralegal came across this appellate opinion and we happen to be looking for bite mark cases. And if you read it, and you know, I'll send you the case site if you're interested because it's still out there. And if you're skeptical of bite marks, which of course I was, he sounds innocent just reading the opinion. You know, so we took that case, we found the, the DNA maybe a year later, and he was exonerated 18 months later, you know, I mean, after 18 years in prison. And his story is the first in the book, and I, I focus on two more on uh, Stephen Cheney and, and Eddie Lee Howard. Because Keith Harward's is a textbook DNA exoneration, and we're getting fewer and fewer of those. And the other two that I focus on in the book are cases where we didn't have ex um, really exonerating DNA evidence, and how hard it is to overturn a junk science conviction. Maybe you could talk about, so I mean, we've had a, a lot of these cases where the bite mark evidence was wholly unreliable, caused an innocent person to be convicted. And maybe you could say, like in 1982, 1984, right after the Ted Bundy trial, where Jim Coleman here was on the, uh, was on the team, the defense team, actually. Oh, yeah. uh, we were talking about the, the Bundy case a little bit in this room at an event celebrating Jim Coleman's work last week. Uh, okay, so it's 1982, 1984. Bite mark evidence sounds incredible. It's done incredible things in murder cases. Um, but flash forward to today, we. We know more about what the scientific underpinnings are or are not, and we haven't studied Daubert in, in my evidence class yet, but the Supreme Court has said in 1993 that you're supposed to look at whether something is reliable and been reviewed by the scientific community before you call someone an expert in court. Um, and yet, you know, you haven't convinced a single state to say, fight mark evidence. Not very good at my job. Is, uh, <laughs> Is so unreliable that we shouldn't be using it anymore. Um, and so, like, well, I, I know you thought a lot about this, but like, what, what do you think the prospects for that are, or what do you think some of the challenges are in using cases like Keith Howard to say, wait a minute, like, we should pause before we we allow someone to say that a that a bite can be matched to someone. A bite mark, I guess. Um, what I think in I'm going to answer the question a little bit differently, but then you asked, but. In, in that vein is that I think that there are some really simple reforms that we could implement that would reduce the amount, the number of wrongful convictions. And the, and one, the simplest, it relates to bias, right? And that if we, you know, had, you know, the, the study, if you look at cases like Keith Harwards and you look at all these bite mark cases, and you look at all the hair comparison cases and all the rest, is that the contextual information was always much more important to those examinations than anything that had to do with what they were seeing under the microscope. And it's been in my experience that when you blind experts in these fields, they're very unwilling to make a call, right? And that they always come out with an inconclusive, you know, or something like that because they don't have any information and because they can't really know because they're not really measuring anything. So there's fierce resistance within the forensic community to, um, to blind the experts. And, and I've never really understood why, other than the, it becomes boring. When you say they're not measuring anything, maybe you could just explain a little more. So like when someone has like a photo, I guess, of, of a, someone's body that was bitten, um, I mean, hopefully most you know, criminal incidents don't involve biting. But when they do, and they, you have a photo of like a red mark with, that looks like it was made by some teeth, um, like what is, what is measured? Like how does this person apply their expertise to reach a conclusion about, about this, I guess a blown up photograph of some red marks on someone's skin? They guess, is <laughs> like, like the bottom line. We see the, the reason that, that Professor Garrett is raising measurement is that most science is based on measuring something. 
right? The um, almost all scientific experiments involve measuring something that includes social sciences. So it's true in almost all fields of science except forensics, right? In forensics, we eyeball the evidence and we come to whatever conclusions that we think are justified by it. And so if you think about an injury, like a bite mark, is that I'm not sure if any of you have kids, but when you do, you'll have toddlers that come home from daycare and they're gonna have bite marks, right? And you look at that and you say, that's a bite mark, right? You know, that's I know one when I see one. You never see those types of bite marks that, particularly when you have your kids say, Johnny bit me, right? You know, it's like we have pretty clear evidence that that was a bite mark. And particularly you have somebody telling you that somebody bit you, like Keith Harward's case, like where the, one of the victims survived. And so for, it was always really mysterious to me is that why is it that we're dentists? We're even like, how is it that one becomes expert in identifying a bite mark? Is it the proximity to teeth? I mean, nothing, right? Because you can do a root canal, mean that you can ID a, a bite mark and distinguish it from something like that was made by a belt buckle or you know zippers or whatever. You would see like a million or bottles, you know, all these other things that look like bite marks in, in your imagination. And so for many years, this kind of, it worked, you know, I mean, essentially that because they're dentists and they know teeth and they know the, the bite marks that teeth create. And what happened in 2015, I believe was the study, it was the first, because you can never know ground truth on these, right? Unless you are at the, the crime, then what these dentists are seeing are photographs, you know, that are sometimes taken days, sometimes weeks later of a victim and an injury. And they were just using their judgment to say, ah, oh, you know, that's a bite mark because I'd seen lots of other bite marks and they look like this. But they don't know that all these other things that they thought were bite marks were actually bite marks because you don't know ground truth on these. And this is true with like, you know, so if you're doing kind of train, relying on training and experience, it's really important to understand what value is gained from that training and experience, right? You, it's not an empirical database in your mind of what a, a bite mark looks like, is particularly if you'd never get ground truth. So you don't get any feedback loop as to how often you were right or how often you were wrong, right? And so a lot of the became a proxy was just like convictions, right? Well, I pled guilty, must have been a bite mark, must have been guilty, must have been a match. So what the only thing you can do with really grossly subjective techniques like that to suggest any kind of reliability, which is Professor Garrett points out, as the Supreme Court says, is supposed to be the inquiry, is to say, okay, we take the same ex experts with the same level of experience, the same credentials, and they give them the same evidence, and they look at that evidence, do they come to the same or similar conclusions, right? That doesn't tell you whether or not they're all right or they're all wrong, but you have something inter-rater reliability, meaning that you're coming to similar conclusions, suggests that it would be reliable to diagnose something as a bite mark because all these experts in the field look at the same evidence and most of them agree, yes, this is a bite mark. So they tested that. It took 100 bite mark uh, photos from casework or, or injuries from casework and just asked the, the threshold issue. Is this a bite mark? not a bite mark, or can you not tell, right? And so they gave it to, um, I think it was something like 50 or so practicing forensic dentists. They did 100 of these, um, and they came to conclusions, I think on 99 of them or something like that, and they were all over the place. It's like flipping a coin. They, and so, you know, some thought it was definitely, some thought it was definitely not, some couldn't tell, and the only one that they knew ground truth was, um, there was one where somebody had, like, um, cut themselves with a box cutter. And then it weirdly looked like a bite mark. It was like, well, why don't we include this one in the study? So they did. And that was the only one where there was greater than 90% agreement that that was a bite mark. <laughs> and yet we can't get rid of it, you know, from criminal trials, so it's a threshold issue. So the next thing I was gonna say, you know, I mean, is that, and we advocate for this at the Innocence Project a lot, is that, you know, we don't have something like the FDA for forensics, right? You know, the, we care more about the safety of consumer products. We care more about toilet paper and aspirin than we do about forensic sciences. There's no federal agency that takes the validation research out of the adversarial system where it gets corrupted by advocates that are trying to use forensics for whatever means they're trying to use them for and make, puts it in a research laboratory where there's not a case or controversy 
where you could um, decide whether or not something, you could demonstrate whether or not something is valid and reliable. And you know, the fact that there's nothing standing between you and a junk science conviction is a judge. And the judge, as uh, research that you and I have done, has demonstrated this empirically, is not going to consult the scientific literature. He's making that type of, she's making that type of decision. They're going to consult case law. And the case law says it's all valid and reliable. Yeah, we did. We have a law review article where we looked at, we were trying to find every case in the country where it was a criminal case in a state that had the modern Rule 702 Daubert standard where the judge said words about reliability. Yeah. Even like, gestured at it. Did they talk, did they say anything about reliability? And the first question was, how often when forensic science is, is at issue, do they say something about whether that evidence is reliable? Even just to say, like, we do a reliability inquiry here. Um, and it was hard to find even, yeah, it was like a couple hundred cases. It was in the many dozens of cases where they even said words about reliability, right. much less actually talking about reliability and asking, like, is there a study? Is there something that tells us whether this is a good technique? I was wondering, so another way that we would hope that, you know, we would have good science in our courtrooms is if the relevant, you know, scientific community steps up and says, like, you can't be making up research. Like, you have to, you have to act like a scientist here. Like, we sort of assume that, like, if a doctor's in court, like, their medical colleagues will stop them from, uh, from, like, you know, saying that, oh, you know, we always, you know, attach pacemakers to car batteries or, you know, no, we don't do that. Um, so in the... I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your interaction with the, the bite mark community, uh, because obviously they, they probably were not thrilled that you created a special litigation unit that would be challenging their existence all around the country. That's not what you, you know, want to have happen, is, is for a group of lawyers to say, we want to put you out of business. No, I, um, I'm certainly unpopular with the forensic odontology crowd. I, uh, and I write about a scene in the book about when we kind of announced our attentions at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences um, because, you know, I, I mentioned that it was unclear how many, you know, when you're first starting out the research to go after a field, I wanted to learn everything that I could possibly know about. So in, and I also write about this is tracing like from the first bite mark case, you know, through all the, the, you know, precedent establishing cases around the country and then actually counting up all the wrongful convictions, you know, I mean, like, so we're doing massive archival research because sometimes you'd be surprised that not all wrongful convictions are trumpeted on the front page of the New York Times. You know, I mean, many of them are smaller, quieter, you know, I mean, and you really have to, like, kind of be digging to find them. And so I came up with, like, I think at that time it was, like, 24 when they had been claiming or admitting to, like, six, you know. And so I gave this lecture and, you know, listed all the cases and I named names of like all the dentists that were responsible and all the years that they had gone after and like there was just crickets at the end of this talk, right? And I was like, walk off. I felt like they were gonna start throwing stuff at me. Cause that's in like the lion's den. The American Academy of Forensic Sciences is where, you know, that, that's like their annual junket for these dentists, so. But what was really frustrating and, and I could tell you crazy stories about, like, kind of the individual, like, you know, which I didn't write about, which is, like, you know, I'd had, you know, dentists chasing me out of bars that wanted to fight, like, literally fight, you know, a 70-year-old man, chase me out of a bar. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, attack bite marks, right? You know, it's the, um, but, you know, it's really, and a lot of it is um, the pernicious influence of case law and the Fry standard and the way that courts have handled this evidence has given a lot of the experts false confidence in their own abilities. So many of them were shocked to have been allowed in and been declared experts at the first instance, right? And so the first pushback that I was getting was like, you say it's junk science. Why is it admissible in all 50 states? Why is every court admitted it? And why have they called it science? You know, so they, they were basically like through a proxy of a legal opinion you know, valid, like, felt like that their science was valid, even though they had done zero research to kind of work with it. And so, and they'd also been deferred to because of the, fry, I, I'm, I guess you guys haven't had this type of evidence, so I'm going to give you a quick and dirty on Fry and Dauber. The Fry is the standard that was developed in the 1920s, first started in the D.C. Court of Appeals with a, actually happened to be an early lie detector test. And they decided, and or one judge made this decision, then it spread throughout the country that became known as the Fry Standard. And what this judge decided was that, 
I'm scientifically illiterate, like most lawyers, like most judges, you know, I mean, and so I don't know science, but so I'm going to defer to the relevant scientific community. And in that community, if it, this theory is generally accepted, then it's going to come in. So I'm going to defer to the relevant community. If it's accepted by that community, then it comes in. So it's essentially a nose counting exercise. But as you can see, you know, just from that definition is what's going to be outcome determinative, right? Can you guess on a prior decision? It's going to be how you define the relevant scientific community, right? And so if you have these hacks that have developed their own clubs and call them, you know, board certifying entities or the American Board of Forensic Gonentology and the, you belong to the right organizations and you've written these textbooks that are full of untested ideas and, you know, methodologies that have never been demonstrated to be valid or reliable, but you've, you own the science. Despite all that, despite there being no science, that all these courts were deferring to the relevant scientific community. So this meant the dentists themselves. And if you ask people whose livelihoods depend on the continued admissibility of their science, whether or not their science is generally accepted, your answer is going to be very obvious, right? And so that went on and goes on for a million years until we get to Dabber. Dabber is supposed to flip the switch, or script, right? And that, that judges are going to act as gatekeepers and they're going to have to apply this um, basic scientific principles to the admissibility of expert witness testimony and that they were going to have to eat their broccoli. In other words, they're going to have to do some research. They're going to have to think about, like, is this actually reliable? And what our research has shown, and, and Peter Neufeld's research has shown this before us, and essentially our 2018 was a follow-up to his, was that in the civil side, Daubert is fairly effective at weeding out unreliable plaintiffs, experts in particular, the uh, um, opinions. But on the criminal side, nothing has changed as a result, not because of wrongful convictions, even though we know that all, half of all DNA exonerations, you know, the, the, a major contributing factor was forensic sciences, right? In other words, junk science. And despite the National Academy of Sciences report, despite the PCAST report, the President's Council of Advisors in, in Science and Technology, these are two major reports on forensics that you should, at some point, I hope you encounter that, but what happened, we should talk about the NAS report a little bit. So they, the NAS report was really important because it was the first time that, so the National Academy of Sciences is the most you know, prestigious scientific organization in the country, maybe the world. And the, what, as a result of wrongful convictions, was asked by Congress to take a look at forensics in the United States because no mainstream scientists had really examined the claims that had been routinely accepted in criminal courts for 100 years. And, you know... There was no reason. It's not like, like, at Duke Medical School, they're going to do studies on, like, bite mark comparisons or fingerprint experiments. Like, they're, you know, they're developing COVID vaccines and curing cancer. Like, they... They're not getting major grants to study stuff that, they're, that the Durham police is using, right? Exactly. Um, there, was, there was no reason for them. So it was a big deal that Congress said, you know what, we'd like, the, like the, the most esteemed scientists in the country to look at stuff that's kind of on the ground, you know, applied stuff. And Professor Garrett was one of the science and law scholars who testified before those committees, and I devoted a chapter on the hearings. And what was really kind of... Um, paradigm shifting was, you know, I just was explaining the Fry standard, and, and Fry is how all these techniques first got in, too, because, you know, Daubert wasn't until the 90s. And so they're used to being deferred to entirely on how this works and why it works and being able to just describe, you know, one thing that's really important to keep your, like, distinct in your mind when you're thinking about any kind of scientific evidence is that there's one thing to gather data and there's another thing to interpret data. Junk scientists are great at gathering data. It's the interpreting data where they have real problems, right? So they have lots of whiz-bangy techniques for photographing bite marks, and they take measurements. They just, they're just meaningless, right? You know what I mean? And they have different types of photographs, and you've got to mount it this way, and you've got to do this, and you have a blah, blah, blah. It's all meaningless. It's none of it's been tested, but it sounds very sciencey. And that works in court. Like magic, right? You know, everybody like uh, like is anesthetized by all the sciencey sounding words and the rest, and it all sounds valid and great and appeals to intuition. 
But then they, these guys get in front of a group of esteemed, skeptical scientists, and scientists are supposed to be skeptical, and it all falls apart, right? Because you get, I write about David Sen, you know, who's like a very prominent forensic odontologist who gives the presentation. He's just talking about all the methodologies. They're like, okay, that's great. Show us the science. And there's none there. And that was true with all these techniques. So the, the forensic, uh, the National Academy of Sciences comes out with this report in 2009. It says that, in essence, that the only technique that's capable of identifying the source of crime scene evidence, right? So that, like, footprint, that hair, that shoe print, that fingerprint, that firearm, none of those techniques are capable of identifying the source. Right? You can't individualize. Only nuclear DNA analysis. And, and that's presented more modestly than many of these other techniques I can't say individualize. But no scientist had come and taken a look at that. So that was the paradigm. You know, I mean, I'm sure that you're sitting here right now believing that fingerprints, right? Isn't that, you know, couldn't we just match that to one person and exclusion of everybody on the planet? No, you can't. And it's particularly true if we have low-quality prints, right? So Brandon and I both write about the Brandon Mayfield case in um, the Madrid, the bombing of the Madrid uh, commuter train in Spain in 2004, I believe. And what that showed was, and, and then there are, now there are scientists that are working on this, so is that if you have a low-quality latent print and you have a lot of cognitive bias like pointing people in one direction or another is that you can get a false positive and you can get a lot of people make, coming to the same conclusion based on the contextual information because the person that was matched to this happened to be a Muslim, happened to have represented somebody that had once been convicted of providing material aid to a terrorist organization. These are the little things that suggested to the FBI that this was their guy. So even in fingerprints, you know, that that type of individualization testimony was no longer accepted by the mainstream scientific community. And we're still fighting those battles right now to implement this kind of scientific fact, I'd say. Maybe we should pause and that was take, a lot. take some questions. Yeah, we'd, lo we'd love to, to hear from you all. Some of you may be hearing about expert evidence in criminal cases for the first time. Others of you may have come across some of this work. Yes. <laughs> we believe in it for so long, so we're going to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a forensic psychologist, uh, not a big law student, so thank you. Hey, thank you for coming. Yes. Um, something I struggle with sometimes is when an attorney is giving you a referral, they'll hand over everything, including mm -hmm. stuff that might have junk science. And there's some of it that I'm going through that I think I shouldn't be reading this. Of course I'm going to be biased. And some of it is just source rates, right? That's in there. And the reason for giving me everything is typically, well, the opposing side has it, so you need to say you read all of it. Any advice for what to do? Because I want to minimize my bias, but I also want to be as comprehensive as it can be. This is a huge, a huge issue. We, we did a panel on this um, at the network conference. I'm sure you have your own thoughts. Um, so if you, I'm happy to, to follow your lead. I think it's a longer conversation, but we want, what right, experts should have a protocol for what information is relevant to their work and what isn't. And ideally, we should be able to say, like, I don't accept information that isn't relevant to my work and makes me more credible. It's going to make me more powerful on the stand. Sometimes you may not know in advance that something is actually irrelevant. Maybe it's the kind of report that you might need. And then when you read it, you see that, oh, wait a minute. Like, I don't need to know that this person confessed. I just need to know you know, that they were charged with um, assault and not, you know, credit card fraud. Um, and so there may be other ways of documenting what you did receive and how. And Adele is here who has worked on, a, like, a standard checklist where you can record, document, and wait that kind of information. So at least it's, it's not a secret that it happened and that it could have affected your work. But ideally, you also want protocols to make sure that you don't get it. Um, I mean, there's been disturbing work of, uh, about even just the standard forms that crime labs have where they solicit biasing information from police. It's part of the submission form to note all the other stuff you, you've heard about, about this defendant when ideally, like, if all you're doing is looking at fingerprints, you should just be looking at the patterns and reaching conclusions about them. You don't need to know that the person confessed or, 
Uh, in other situations, sometimes you do need to know more, right? Or at least maybe you need to know what surface it was that the fingerprint was left on. Or, um, but uh, um, but it's, yeah, this hasn't been a topic in the past. But in the past, it's sort of like, you know, the forensic experts part of the, the prosecution team. They should be talking to the detectives, and they should all be spending time together. Uh, I, I would, you know, and, and Professor Garrett has accurately said it all as anticipated, but I would add... Um, it's a different issue when you're a like, uh, defense attorney at the trial level and you're dealing with the problem of, you know, you have, first of all, one of the, the main recommendations for the National Academy of Sciences in their report was to separate law enforcement from crime labs to avoid this type of, you know, major problem because a lot of forensic experts view themselves as crime fighters, not as scientists, you know, which is a huge problem just in mentality to begin with. But the... It's also that we know, if you're a defense attorney, that prosecution experts are being biased and there's no, like, effort not to. In fact, the opposite is going on, you know what I mean? And so they're going to, like, you know, this is, I'm sure that there are exceptions, but by and large, there's no efforts to mitigate. And they want their experts to implicate the people that prosecutors are ethically required to subjectively believe they're guilty, right? And so you have this. And so you as a defense attorney, you'll all be defense attorneys, I know. The uh, is that you're in a really awkward position, and is that if you are going to have some scientific integrity, you know, and or some just plain old integrity, and that you don't want, you know, to bias this expert, you know, and that you want an actual objective opinion, you know, I mean, are you going to be handicapping your client? At, is that going to be at the expense of your client, right, who would be better off with a biased opinion in court? Now, I'm not here to provide the answer to that, but that's a serious issue. I will tell you the way that I do it now because I have the luxury of taking cases that I only want to take, you know what I mean, and that's why we're doing strategic litigation is that what I do with my experts is that I blind them entirely, and they hate it, right? You know what I mean? It's that they all they like, want more, you know I me mean? more. I say, fabricate, I need, like, blah, blah, blah. It's like, I just want, you know, I didn't ask you for that. I know, you know, it's blah, blah, blah. You know, get those opinions. And this is why I've done my own, like, kind of anecdotally, have an understanding of, like, they're much more, more, less willing, I should say, to come to really firm conclusions because they don't have any other information. It tells you a lot. And what I find effective as an advocate is that when I put my expert on the stand, I elicit from them, you have no information about this case, right? You don't know if it's a murder or if it's a misdemeanor, right? You don't know when it was. You don't know who the lawyers were. He didn't give you any information. I didn't tell you how I wanted you to come out, what I expected, nothing, right? No, zero. I just had this opinion. And then I cross-examine the state's experts about all the biasing expert uh, information that they have. And that's been pretty effective, but that's a post-conviction case, so it's a little bit different. More questions? Yes. You know, you've put your finger on, I think, uh, essential tension with the use of scientific evidence in law, period, right? Because science is a process that's always moving forward, right? So hypotheses are falsified, they're rejected, we move on, and we keep, like, kind of improving our knowledge and rejecting what we used to know. And case law is kind of the opposite, right? Static, you know, it moves very incrementally, and then once it's established in case law, it's done. And... And as you point out, you know, this is kind of the pre-science era where that mode was kind of developed, you know, in the law before we were using a lot of scientific evidence where it's rapidly advancing and rapidly changing. So what I think, and we, we've done a lot of this type of work, in, particularly in Fry litigation, is that because most Fry jurisdictions, and there's still many, you know, I mean, some of the most popular states in the country use Fry in New York, California, Illinois, you know, for some examples is that it required that the technique be novel, right? And so in other words, that it had to be a relatively new technique. Otherwise, you weren't even going to get a hearing, 
Right, so they wouldn't even consider it because there's already establishing case law. We have a, a case in the Illinois Supreme Court right now that's going to be deciding this issue. Maybe, we'll see. And the and this is a wrongfully convicted guy on bite mark evidence, um, coincidentally. Is that, but we have been successful in that type of litigation by getting courts to acknowledge through the work that we've done on hair and bite marks and shaken baby syndrome and some of the other um, discredited diagnoses that we pointing out empirically, you know, I mean, it's like we can't say that you can't get a fry hearing on a bite mark case because we once decided that the earth was flat. You know, now we have pretty good evidence that it's round that we have to have scientific reality capable of overruling case law. Right, and so that type of advocacy, I think, is an important aspect of, of this work. I um, and it should be any faithful application of Daubert on any of these techniques. You know, I mean, would eliminate them. You know, I mean, right? Just so you started with air rates, but I'm not sure if I've answered your question exactly. I don't know if you have a different answer. I don't know. It's a it's a it's a hard issue because we. I mean, ideally, Daubert was designed to allow judges to update and to take advantage of new research and. But even in the Daubert states, there's been a real adherence to tradition. Um, and uh, if it makes you feel better, in inquisitorial countries that don't have a common law system, there's lots of deference <coughs> to experts without a lot of vetting. In some ways, we're more anxious about expert evidence because we have jurors, and we're worried about jurors being misled by, by, by poor science. And so we do actually have more gatekeeping. Actually, a lot of inquisitorial countries have borrowed the Daubert standard. How will they apply it is another question. I mean, it's not like there's like a better system out there where they're handling scientific evidence really well. I mean, it is somewhat of a global problem, unfortunately. It's true. I get asked that a lot. And um, I'm always just like, well, I hear Australia does this hot tubbing thing. Like, <clears throat> <laughs> we should stop because I know some of you have classes to go to. But if you want to more learn more about hot tubbing in Australia or Daubert or Fry, uh, you could come down and, and talk more if you have time before your next class. But let's, let's give a big thank you to uh, the